In the Idaho 4 case, we are looking ahead, no more looking back. And today we have five insights into this important case. A lot of people leave their comments on their perspectives on our videos, and we're here to explore some of those perspectives. When scrolling through YouTube, you can find a million, million, million different perspectives on what's going on with the Idaho 4 case. And in this episode of About the Law, we'll be looking at some of them. I'm Lainey Law. And I'm Andrew Myers. And it's funny because when you go through the comments on YouTube, on our videos, other channels, even just watching other channels, it's crazy to see that some people feel really, really strongly one way or the other. And we're going to take a look at some of the reasons behind that today. Yeah, we have five um, insights into the case. And the first three, we're going to ask you to listen really closely and tell us which one applies. Which one of the first three applies in this case, and particularly to Brian Koberger, and uh, whether or not he is involved in the case, and if he is, to what extent, and why, and how. So here are the first three options. We are going to go to the first one right now. And we are going to take a look at uh, whether he was, in fact, the suspect. Now, bear in mind, as we've said before, and I'll say it again, and we'll run a banner towards the end of the show. On this podcast, we take a legal view. We know there's a lot in the background, but looking ahead, we take a legal view. And Mr. Koberger, as are all criminal defendants, entitled to a presumption of innocence. Mr. Koberger is presumed innocent, and we presume him innocent here in this podcast. For option one, we're going to look at whether he was a mass murderer or a serial murderer. He might have been both, depending on the definition and who you listen to tell us those definitions. But it has been said that there are two different types of serial or mass murderers. There is the just random, sporadic, uh, disorganized, and then there's the organized. And it has been said that Mr. Koberger or whoever uh, took part in these crimes was a very organized serial killer or mass murderer. Now, what's the difference? You ask me a serial murderer, obviously, is somebody that commits a crime and then another one, and then another one, and there's time in between. A mass murderer, depending on whether you look at the um, FBI or some of the other state definitions, is someone that kills three or more or four people at the same time. So this, it has been said, was a very organized um, crime because of the way it was committed in such a short period of time. We've looked at the timeline and, you know, in 12 or 14 minutes, there were um, four murders. Uh, it's just a very difficult to believe that. Uh, Mr. Koberger is said by those who have studied him and who have studied this crime, very controlling. He had every um, item that he thought about controlled. This was a pre-selected scene, and at least one or two of the victims were pre-selected. Uh, it is said by those who have studied this that he had either stalked and or observed these people. Did he uh, watch uh, the two who worked at the Mad Greek restaurant? Uh, did he actually go to the street that's behind 1122 King Road and watch, as you could see in Maddie Mogan's window? Did he do that? Uh, it is said that this was a very meticulously planned thing. Mr. Koberger had a degree and he was now studying uh, criminology to get a PhD. Uh, it is said that, you know, we know that this was a party house. It was a party house. People were in and out all the time. And in one of the videos that's available of three of the three times the police went to this party house in the months before the um, crime and told the people to quiet down, there were noise complaints. It was said by the people that came to the door that none of the actual residents of that um, home were home. So it is said that it's possible that Mr. Koberger uh, had been in and out of there and kind of scoped it out in his, in his head. He knew where the various bedrooms were. He knew where various people slept and stayed. So it's hard to believe anything else if you think about it that these crimes were committed as i said so quickly in that time frame um 
So these were very controlled, methodical uh, crimes. And it's also potential that Mr. Koberger, when he was there, he may have installed some kind of a listening device or observational device. He may well, as some other serial or mass murderers have done, installed some kind of a device in that home. We know that uh, he had helped a, a young woman uh, install some uh, video surveillance in her condo. So this is something he knew how to do, and it's kind of creepy. Wouldn't you agree that he uh, would have done this and he would have been organized to that point where he did that? Yeah, I mean, when we talked about with CJ in one of our previous videos about the fact that you're able to sit at that parking lot and actually look into the house and see what's going on, I think that, you know, obviously we want to give the viewers their own chance to make their own decisions based on the slides that we provide and the information we provide. So try not to base your comment off of what I'm saying. But I think that logically for a lot of people that are in kind of the Brian is guilty camp, you know, all innocent until found guilty. But I think that a lot of people who are fall into that camp are considering something more like this because when you consider that he is like a phd student like you need to go and think of like the logistics behind that and how hard things like that are and that you know if the, if you're studying criminology you're really into things and trying to focus and do them well and the fact that some things you know that we're even having these discussions and it's just not you know purely out there that he's guilty people i think would agree with the meticulously planned one argument against that would be though the sheath it's like if he if this all was meticulously planned then how did he even end up getting caught i think is one of the things that people would be wondering about well the answer to that is that uh in his younger years uh mr koberger had uh said that he um dissociated he sometimes when he was with his parents he felt like he wasn't even with them uh when he uh was out and about he didn't feel that he was really a part of what was going on and so he had he had a feeling of dissociation when he was young he also had um visual snow which is a neurological symptom i've actually everything's totally completely confidential but i've had clients that have this symptom and it's very 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 difficult to diagnose neurologically but as difficult as it is to diagnose neurologically in my experience with people who have had that it is equally disturbing one can be you know doing something and all of a sudden it comes on and it's like the old-fashioned tvs when there was snow maybe some of the younger people in our audience won't remember that but before the digital era if you went to a tv channel that wasn't all there you'd just see snow and that's how it's been described to me so Mr. Koberger had dissociative blips is the way that they are described. And so that could explain why everything was so meticulously planned and organized. But, you know, he left the sheath somehow. Yeah. Uh, so that would be one. Ex there are other explanations, I know. But that's one explanation. So that's option uh, five. Let's go to the next one. In our um, insight number four is that this was a random crime. And I know there are people out there that say, oh, well, Ann Taylor says there's no connection between, you know, her client, Brian Koberger, and the Idaho Four. The, this, the, this couldn't have been a random crime. Uh, there's just no proof. There's no evidence tying uh, Mr. Koberger to these four. Well, you know what? So what? There are lots of random crimes and I'm just going to point out two of them. Uh, and uh, rather than make people do their research, there was a horrible guy by the name of Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, uh, who terrorized uh, Southern California back in 1984, 1985. And there's a Netflix on him. And Tiller Russell was the Netflix producer who studied this guy a lot. And he said, quote, his murder spree was so random that the victims could have been anyone in uh, a very good author uh, said uh, the complete randomness of his violence which traversed all age groups really just terrorized california that was dr gary bricado the author of the book of the new evil 
awesome book if you haven't read it and you're into the kind of thing we're talking about today. I highly recommend that you get it. But this is one of many examples of a random crime. There was no connection whatsoever between Richard Ramirez and the Night Stalker and uh, his uh, victims. Then we go to BTK or Dennis Rader, and we know that this is someone that um, Brian Kohlberger studied at DeSales University through his teacher. Dennis Rader uh, is accused of killing at least 10 people in Wichita and Park City, Kansas, between 1974 and 1991. Victims all random, occasionally men and children. Usually, though, he did target women this is the gentleman who, I, I hate to call him a gentleman because he was anything but, um, he admitted to uh, 10 and more, actually, uh, murders. And uh, he was a Sunday school teacher and a, a Boy Scout leader and all the rest. And so he came off to society as this wonderful, great pillar of society. And meanwhile, he was binding, torturing, and killing people. That's what BTK stood for. So there are two of many, 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 if you study this stuff, uh, and I've been reading true crime since I was a young guy, and obviously I'm not a young guy. I'm youngish. <laughs> Anyhow, random crime is not unusual, and so therefore I contend that it's totally meaningless for some people to say, oh, well, there's no connection between Brian Koberger and the Idaho Four, and Taylor has already said that there's nothing to connect them. So what? Okay, so that's our that's our second um, view here. I do want to say that yeah. In like as far as like a random crime goes, you mentioned before like the visual snow, and I don't really know how visual snow compares, but I know things like tinnitus. Uh, people who suffer from tinnitus, they have like a sound that's not from like external sources that they just constantly hear like ringing in their heads, and I know that a lot of people who have that end up with anxiety, depression. Uh, there's increased suicidality against in those groups, so. It's interesting to think not, you know, I'm not a doctor. We're not diagnosing anything, like we said, proven, uh, innocent until proven guilty. So, but these are just opinions where it's like, if you have something that could be potentially impairing your everyday to day activities, somebody might be able to argue like, oh, you know, this person snapped. They were dissociating before they had this visual snow issue. There might be something neurological going on in there that was basically like a short fuse and led to this random act. Yeah, good point. Good point. So let's now go to um, our third uh, vision. There we go. So now the next option is that maybe they have the wrong guy. And a lot of people say this, a lot of people, and we're not saying it, but a lot of people say he's being framed. Mr. Kohlberger is being framed. So tell us if you agree with option one, option two, or this option. And they just kind of pegged Mr. Kohlberger because he fits the profile. I've never been a big fan of profiling. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I am not a big fan of profiling. I'll say that right off the bat. And maybe uh, Mr. Kohlberger is the square peg that fits in the round hole of uh, solving this crime. You know, when he was young, many people said he was socially awkward. Uh, his friends, uh, a lot of them in high school, said he was overweight. Uh, and because he was overweight, as a teen, teenage years are hard enough, but he was overweight and he was bullied all the time. Uh, one of his friends, uh, and I quote, said that of Brian Koberger in his formative high school years, people were not his strong suit. That's one way to put it. Uh, we all know that he had a, a heroin addiction. Uh, he overcame that apparently, and so he's a recovered user. We don't know what scars that uh, placed on his personality. I want to say congratulations to everyone who's overcome that. But in Brian Koberger's case, we don't know what scars uh, left. He moves out to Washington State. He gets a teaching job, and it was widely said by those who observed him that he was very demeaning to women. Uh, in the classroom, uh, he uh, was said to be much more harsh in grading and commenting upon their uh, classroom participation. And he also was said to be demeaning to female faculty members. Uh, and he was also uh, in the process of being fired or had been fired from his teaching position at uh, Washington State University. And so, you know, those are things that paint a picture of a guy that doesn't fit in. So if you're looking for somebody that uh, had committed a heinous crime, 
There he is. So those, those are the first three possibilities. There's a ton more possibilities, but those are the three we're looking at today uh, as to um, what was going on uh, with Mr. Koberger. And so we hope you give us a comment down below and tell us which one you like. A lot of people in our comments have already previously mentioned, I mean, I, like I said, we get a lot of different comments saying one way or the other, but a lot of people I do see... Uh, I, I think a lot of people have distrust of police, but I think it comes across a lot in the comment section, surprisingly. And I, I want to say, like, you know, our comment section, I'm not going to say it's more one way or more the other. We get people saying he's guilty, 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 innocent, innocent, innocent. They got the wrong guy. Um, but I do notice that a lot of people do seem to have some distrust in, like, the legal and justice system. And a lot of people think he's being framed. A lot of people think that they just didn't really look into it. So it's going to be interesting seeing uh, what's coming up and how that's going to play out. Yeah, exactly. In uh, 2026, when we get a trial, 2020, oh, 2030. Well, I checked. 2036. <laughs> you know, I mean, I said at the outset that we're trying to look ahead in this case. And if I had a crystal ball, which I don't, I'd be able to tell you when the trial date is. But uh, they were going to shoot for uh, June of 2024. Uh, that's what the prosecution wanted. And then the uh, defense attorney said, well, no, how about June of 2025? Uh, and when pushed uh, by the judge, she then said, well, the earliest I could possibly even think about doing it would be maybe March of 20. So that's up in the air. So let's get back to things we can take a look at right now. And that is, you know what, Laney, a lot of people uh, have pointed out, not only in the comments section, but elsewhere where I've read it and looked at this case. Uh, it's only so circumstantial. All the evidence is circumstantial. Well, you know what? So what? Circumstantial evidence is real evidence. Uh, and I'm going to take a look at that right now. Uh, under the federal model criminal jury instruction 1.5, the law makes no distinction between the weight to be given to either direct or circumstantial evidence. Well, you know, why am I looking at the federal rule? Because Idaho's um, standard model jury instructions right now are in a state of flux. There was, you know, and this happens all the time. There's an instruction and an attorney challenges it. They want to overturn a conviction. And so they uh, they strike that uh, instruction and it's uh, rewritten. So at the time that I did this, that was the um, status of what was going on in this case. So um, let's take a look at what uh, a model instruction, which is fairly standard. This is what I learned in law school years and years ago. Uh, there we go. Here we go. Here is the model criminal jury instruction in the federal court uh, on circumstantial evidence. You know, by the way, it's very rare. I mean, I've read a lot and I've followed a lot of cases. It's rare, rare, rare that you're going to actually have someone say, I saw the defendant shoot the victim. It's so rare. That's why we're talking about circumstantial evidence. The other uh, possibility being, you know, even with all of the security cameras that we have out there, it's somewhat rare even now to actually have a video of the crime being uh, committed. It does happen. But so that's why circumstantial evidence is so important. And the jury is instructed that evidence may be direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is direct proof of a fact, such as testimony by a witness about what that witness personally saw or heard or did. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence. That is, it is proof of one or more facts from which one can find another fact. You, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, are to consider both direct and circumstantial evidence. That's important because people say, oh, well, the Koberger case is only circumstantial. So what? The court is going to tell the ladies and gentlemen in the jury box that you are to consider both direct and circumstantial evidence. Either can be used to prove any fact. The law makes no distinction between the weight to be given to either direct or circumstantial evidence. It is for you to decide how much weight to be given to any of the evidence. So I just think that that's really important. And one of the um, standard uh, examples that I've heard judges give in uh, jury instructions is this. You let the dog out before you go to bed and you look out and you see the lawn. There it is. All right. You go to bed. 
You get up the next morning, there's snow all over the lawn. Now, you didn't see it snowing, but from the circumstantial evidence of the snow being on the lawn now where it wasn't before, you can deduce the fact that, hey, guess what? It snowed overnight. Now, that's a simplified version, but I've heard judges say that, and that is kind of an example of what circumstantial evidence is. So there really shouldn't be, I mean, there's a lot of room for argument in this case, but that shouldn't be one of the areas where there's argument because circumstantial evidence is in fact true and complete evidence. So now our final vision for today is number five, discovery disputes. Uh, there was a hearing a couple of weeks ago uh, in which the defense and the prosecution went before judge, judge, and they were saying, you know, we're having trouble um, with certain areas. I don't know if I believed it all, but anyhow, we'll, we'll stay straight here and say that um, we do know that it took months and months and months of fighting over the investigative genetic genealogy. And the court finally said, OK, you can have a portion of it. Uh, Ann Taylor has now pointed out that's a really important video that she's only getting in dribs and drabs. I didn't I didn't understand that at all. Did you understand that? No, that was really weird. I don't really know why they would only give you portions of a video. And the fact that she was mentioning that they're trying to piece together the audio and the video like together even is really bizarre to me. It's bizarre that they wouldn't just give the whole video. And it's bizarre that the video you have to play games, guessing games with it is really crazy. Yeah, and I didn't know whether this was video of the car driving around. You know, there's the Linda Lane video that uh, people say, there it is. You can see that's definitely the uh, car. That's it. And it was turning around. And then there's other people who are saying, oh, it's so blurry, you can't tell. Then other people are even saying it was phonied up. Well, I don't agree with any of those things because I don't know. It's really hard to tell from here what it is, when it is, what's going on with it. So, you know. But the point is here that there's still a lot of problems with the discovery. And we only know about the IgG and the video. And Ann Taylor said that uh, she still doesn't have expert reports. And these are some of the reasons why she is unable to um, try the case as quickly as everybody wants her to. Uh, but now let's take a look at uh, what the Idaho discovery rule says is out there that uh, should be um, discovered. And here we go. This is Idaho Criminal Rule 16 on discovery. And this is the rule that is cited at the top of all of the discovery requests, every single one of them. And it may or not be instructive of what they're still having trouble with. Uh, but the uh, rule uh, goes over the type of information, evidence, and material that the prosecution must turn over to the defendant when requested. This goes over and above the Brady information that we've talked about before, where the prosecution has to turn over all exculpatory evidence. But this is uh, requests that the uh, defendant makes that the prosecution has to turn over. So one of the things would be a statement of the defendant. We don't know if there even are any statements of the defendant, but we do know that at some point the police did actually sit Mr. Koberger down and talk to him, and it said that there was no record of it. Well, I don't know. That's kind of hard to believe. Uh, number two, statement of a co-defendant. As far as we know, and when this first came up, it was said to be very controversial, but as far as we know right now, there is no co-defendant. Defendant's prior record, as far as we know, there's no prior record, but it's something the defense can ask for. Number four, here's the meteor part of the um, Idaho rule on criminal discovery. Here are things that the defendant is entitled to. Documents and tangible objects on written request of the defendant. The prosecuting attorney must, not may or can think about or can drag his feet. The prosecuting attorney must permit the defendant to inspect and copy or photograph. Books papers, documents, photographs, tangible objects, buildings or places. Gee, whatever happened to that building? <laughs> or copies or portions of them that are in the possession, custody, or control of the prosecuting attorney and that are material to the preparation of the defense, are intended for use by the prosecutor as evidence at trial, or were obtained from the defendant or belong to the defendant. So any of the stuff on this list that I just went down, books, papers, documents, you know, if the defendant requests them and their material to the preparation of the defense and the prosecutor is intending to use them, 
there's no choice. I don't know why they're fighting over this. They, they've they got to turn it over. Uh, and there's no, by the way, there's no discretion uh, granted to the judge. Note, note the word that it says uh, all the way back up here. It says that they must turn this stuff over. They must turn this stuff over, except as otherwise provided in this rule, the prosecuting attorney must, not might, can, can think about dragging his feet. So, so that's the rule. I thought it was really important to point that out. Um, I haven't seen it pointed out elsewhere. Not sure why, because I think it's pretty important. So we get back to our discovery dispute and, um, you know, what else is uh, being held back? What else, you know, Ann Taylor kind of intimated they're all under this gag order, the non-dissemination order. They can't uh, disclose what's going on in the case. But when Ann Taylor had a chance, Brian Koberger's attorney, to speak in open court, she kind of alluded to these things. She talked about the really important video and she talked about the expert reports. And I was waiting for her to talk about other stuff. But um, I guess we'll have to leave it there. And... Um, one of the other interesting things I found going back to our very first um, insight into this case and the, the personality of Mr. Kohlberger, it was said that he was so controlling. And if you go with that option, again, if you go with that option, he was so controlling and he had such a big ego and he was so into all the details of what was happening that one of the reasons that he would have allowed Ann Taylor to go ahead and allow for the destruction of the premises is that it's good for his ego. He's got a big ego and he's controlling and he's in charge. And so for him to say, I'm so important that I not only committed this crime, but I allowed for the destruction of that house. I found that comment to be pretty amazing when I heard it. But so those are our five insights going forward. Uh, we don't know exactly what the next step is. We're all waiting for the shoe to drop on on, on what's going on. But um, that's kind of um, crazy, and that's kind of what's happening right now. Do you have a preference of any of the three options? You know, it's interesting to me to think that, because one of the things that was on like the third option of being innocent one of the arguments made is that he you know was like disparaging to women disrespectful to women but it's interesting seeing that he's having a woman represent him right now um that being said it's gonna be really hard to say one way or the other i mean like even with our comment sections people feel very strongly one way or the other uh, from an outside perspective it doesn't really feel like they have that much to attach him. A lot of people are like, oh, DNA, DNA, DNA. But as we've talked about before, DNA doesn't really mean anything. Um, as, you know, touch DNA can't be the only factor. So it's going to be interesting to see what else comes out of this, what gets released. We have 51, you know, terabytes of video. I don't know what could possibly come out with that. But even right now, from the little that we know, I don't know what what do they what do we really know? We have some DNA and we have a matching car. Yeah, yeah, you know. And um, my thought on what you just said about it being ironic that he was demeaning to women, uh, and he ended up with Ann Taylor. My understanding about that is that um, the number of um, state of court appointed attorneys is limited enough in Idaho. I don't know. I only practice in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Uh, but the number of attorneys that are qualified for a capital murder case, of which this is one, is extremely limited. And at the time that the court needed to appoint an attorney to this case, she was the only one that was available. She was the only one that would, I mean, you get certified. You're not just anybody can walk in and get appointed by a court to defend people that are, are entitled constitutionally to a defense attorney. So you have to get certified to that, but it's a whole additional higher level of certification to be certified to defend a capital murder defendant. And so my understanding was she was one of the only, if not the only uh, certified capital murder defense attorneys available at the time that Mr. Koberger needed an attorney. And that of course was way back in January of 2022, when he was shipped back from his uh, parents' home in Pennsylvania. 
So now she's a year into the case. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is what choice did he have to begin with? Mm -hmm. uh, not that she's a bad choice because she's experienced. She's handled a bunch of cases. But now that she's an, a year into the case and God knows how many terabytes mm -hmm. into the case, how foolish would it be for him to say, oh, I don't want her anymore. She's a woman. I don't mm -hmm. want her. So, I mean, she apparently is... Um, headlong into this case it would be silly to not allow her to keep going uh if another attorney came in you know they'd have to start from scratch and start going through all of the stuff and um so nobody would nobody would really want that i don't know i don't know there were some uh, really telling things about uh, mr kohlberger uh looking into number one or number five actually you know he he had a tough uh teenage time uh, he allegedly admitted as a teen that he felt no emotion. Uh, he felt like a sack of meat. Uh, and he told a childhood friend that he wanted to study high pro profile criminals. So mm. there's that. There's just an interesting past. There's a past that just, you know, the more you look into the man, the more. And, you know, I don't like the analogy of a, a, a onion and digging layers and layers. I don't like that. But. I guess it works here because the man, you know, had so much uh, inside that he didn't let out. But now um, it is coming out. So I don't know. This uh, is to everybody watching this. Make sure to develop intimate relationships with everybody around you and that everybody thinks you're a good person. So if you're ever accused of a crime, you have all these people saying they were so nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Um, a lot of times, like I guess BTK Dennis Rader that we talked about before. You know, he was a Sunday school teacher, and he, um, you know, was active in the Scouts. And his daughter was just shocked because she described just a normal, average, happy, middle class upbringing. He would take her fishing. He would take them shopping. He would. You know, they would have a nice Christmas with a Christmas tree and presents and the so. Crazy. To the outward world, you know, it seemed like a normal kind of a thing. And how many how many times have you watched TV and they they catch some uh, alleged criminal? They catch a defendant and everybody, oh, he was so nice. Oh, he was just a nice guy next door. He always, you know, he was no always idea. walking. He was always <laughs> walking the dog. And oh, anyhow, um, I don't know where that leaves us. Um, <laughs> do we have some comments to read? Uh, we have a ton of comments that come in. Um, do you want to start? Sure. We, love to, we love to read comments. So the more you comment, the more we'll read them. If you don't want us to read them, don't send them. <laughs> Why don't you start? So the first one was from Based Texans. And they were actually commenting, ooh, we get another video this weekend. Nice. So I thought that was cute that people were appreciative to an extra video. Okay. That's it? Yeah. Well, I can read more comments. I didn't know if you that's wanted fine. to go. <laughs> no, that's okay. Let's see. Um I don't want to read this one, but I'm uh -huh. <laughs> I shouldn't even read this one, but I'm going to. So you can see what we're up against here. WTF is wrong with this judge. Why can't he put his foot down and have the prosecution turn over everything? What is going on? Please explain this behavior. It's bizarre. If Brian is innocent, why isn't he pushing for a speedy trial if there is no real evidence tying him to this crime? There was a planned attack by the frat brats and Anne, I hope is looking into this just my opinion okay as you would say there's a lot to unpack here, <laughs> but um, you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm just reading these I'm not gonna say WTF is wrong with it <laughs> <laughs> at, the, at the expense of being disbarred you know <laughs> I mean it's a tough case the judge and we talked about this before but going forward it gets even worse because the judge has to consider the defendant's right to a speedy trial I know he's waived it but that is still a consideration he's got to you know consider the fact that this guy is behind bars uh his freedom has been taken away from him and if he's innocent that's not good so he's got to balance that against you know the attorney saying that she's not ready and she needs more time I don't know. Uh, my name is not Solomon and I'm not a judge. It would seem, however, prudent that at some point a court would need to set deadlines. We get scheduling orders in our cases here. We get scheduling orders or tracking orders and they tell us what the deadlines are. You will be done with your discovery on this date. You will be done with your responses on this date. You will be uh, filing all your motions on this date. And that's it. That's it. Um, now, 
Can they waive those? Yes, they can if both sides agree and if there is good cause. So it would seem that that would be helpful. And the judge did ask the parties at one of the hearings, you know, would it be helpful if I set these deadlines? And then if they don't comply with those deadlines and they try and bring up some evidence at trial that they haven't brought out in this discovery, just say no. Just say no. Don't you know if you if you don't produce it in your discovery before the deadline, too bad, so sad. So that's that's my answer to that. And the rest of the comment, you know, is just totally speculative and I don't I really don't want to go there. So that's my answer. All right. The next one that I have is a bit long. So it's from Morning Dove 2438. And it says Good Andrew, good evening, Andrew. Question: The main camera, uh, let's state they used to determine the suspect coming on the Crean Road wasn't gathered until the 18th or the 19th, uh, 11, 12 door cam. To be honest, law enforcement have not put out one photo or video. They stand by all photos and videos were leaked to mainstream media or YouTube. Do you not think the door cam should have been gathered immediately and used for? A bolo, which I don't know what that means. Be on the lookout. B O L O. Be on the lookout. So Shouldn't that be a B O T? Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> what that's what it stands for. Uh, the sister of Kaylee, Olivia, has stated on main, uh, mainstream media news up to almost seven weeks later. She feared the video footage was going to be lost because she felt law enforcement had allowed the first uh, 48 hours to go by uh, without gathering crucial footage. So. It said there was a question in there, but it just sounds like they were concerned about the video footage getting lost, that there's an essential, they think that there's an important video footage to this and that that it's potentially gone, from what I'm understanding this. They certainly should have gotten that video. You know what enters my mind, and it's a totally different thing, but um, when the horrible, horrible, horrible uh, Boston Marathon bombings occurred back in 2013, uh, the FBI came in immediately, immediately, even sooner than immediately. And they went up and down Boylston Street and every other street in Back Bay, Boston, and they commandeered all of the video. And that's a very, of course, it, it's different. It's Boston. It's one of the major cities of the country. It's not Moscow, Idaho. And it's a commercial area. There's, uh, you know, there's a hotel right across the street. There are businesses. There's a Dunkin' Donuts. There's all kinds of businesses up and down that street. And so the FBI went in and immediately commandeered all of the video. And, you know, by the end of the week, they found the Zarnayev brothers through that video. Now, again, it's hard to compare those two things because Boston's a major city. This was a terrorist attack on the city of Boston. At the same time, though, is it really that unfair? Because, I mean, this is the murder of four innocent college kids. Uh, huge. This is huge. And I don't know why a huge effort wasn't made immediately to grab all video in the area. Video, you know, uh, still photographs, people, you know, go through every single house, every single video, every single, you know. So, yeah. You know, I that's my response to that comment. It, it's a different scale. I understand that. But is it? So mm -hmm. I I just, you know, I, I will say this. Um, and if I'm talking too much, just tell me to shut up. But the other thing that came to mind as you were reading that is um, there were many, many, many criticisms of the way South Carolina Law Enforcement Division did their job in the, mur in the murder case. But they got their conviction. And there was a lot of criticism both at, at the trial and in the, you know, talk like we're doing now, like we're doing now, a lot of criticism of South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. But just in the last week or so, I actually saw a really good um, YouTube, which I can't give you the actual name of, but three of the SLED investigators, a young woman and two guys she worked with, uh, her name was Laura, and I forget the other two guys' names. Um, we're sitting there casually now in their casual clothes talking about the entire investigation. And they said, people got it wrong. And here's why. Why didn't we wear booties when we went into the shed? Because it was all wet. And the booties are made of water. I mean, are made of uh, paper. What happens to paper in the water? And so they explained step by step the criticisms that they got during that investigation. And... Um, what they did, how they did it, why they did it, and how they did pretty much go by the book. So that, that 
I'm not defending the police, but I am saying we shouldn't we shouldn't just really blast them for this because it was a tough, 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 tough case, and they did what they did, and they are subject to a non dissemination order. They can't defend themselves. So now that I've blasted them, I defend them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is it my turn to read uh, one? Yeah, I mean, I have more. Okay, yeah, I got, I got a bunch of. I don't know, I don't know which one to, um, to read. Here we go. I like this one. Remember the? Do you remember the setup that they had in the hearing uh, on the uh, scheduling order and the motion? It was like they divided the screen into four segments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, here we go. This comment is from Jay Ray Lynn. In my opinion, seeing Ashley Jennings that close up isn't doing the prosecution any favors. The looks she gives are worth a thousand words. Mm. But then again, I do tend to read too far into facial expressions sometimes. Maybe that's just her face. You know, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt because we'll have what I think is a great episode. And then there'll be like three comments being like, wow, even Lainey's bored. And I'm like, wow, I thought, I was like, I thought that was a great video. <laughs> are you bored now? <laughs> No, be honest. Be honest. No, Are you bored? She's bored. Time. She's bored. She's bored. No. She's bored. She's <laughs> bored. Look at her. Cold videos. That's literally how it feels, though. So it's just like, I mean, you know, I don't. And that's one of the things that I think about, too, is just like, well, how do you look engaged? Isn't someone that's engaged actually just pay, well, they needed a attention? They needed a producer. There should have been a producer when Court TV or one of the other you know networks goes in there. Uh, in addition to the camera people and the sound people and the field people, there's a producer sitting back and watching it and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, do this. They, they need a producer. And I know it's the it's. God knows who's in charge of that. But I mean, there were four screens, one whole screen condensed prosecution, defense, the prosecution attorneys, and Taylor, uh, the defense attorney, and Mr. Koberger. And then uh, Mr. Lagston came around the side. All those people are one little teeny screen. And the other screen was just her. Just Ashley Jennings, who's a prosecutor. And, you know, it wasn't even a, a, a torso shot like I have now or a head and shoulders shot. It was almost a face <laughs> shot. And there should have been a producer to say, Ashley, back up. Ashley, you know, we want a face and shoulders shot. You need to back up because she was really hot on that camera. It was a friend <laughs> about like that. Whereas being compared to the camera that had the courtroom, which was really wide. I mean, I know the judge doesn't want close ups of Mr. Koberger, but it was very hard, really, to see the defense Anything. attorneys. You know, I mean, yeah, we didn't want to see their papers. OK, that's fine. But, you know, somebody should have stepped in. And the other attorney, the defense attorney, you know, she was sitting, she was kind of hunched down like this. So they need a producer to kind of come in and set it up and, you know whatever okay so i'd that's, be like hey smile <laughs> i don't know i don't know what paying attention looks and like i didn't really nothing. understand why she <laughs> needed those two attorneys really needed to be there i wasn't really sure i mean if they couldn't make it to court that day also just hide your camera like we don't really need to see their faces like because if you like just hide it then it'll be like a picture on zoom or something and yeah i didn't i didn't really know why uh because they i mean if they had been interacting if they had been interacting yeah. and asking questions or making comments or saying hey judge what about this okay but they they just sat there so uh, i, don't know. I feel like if you look at anybody that up close for an hour i feel like you're gonna like anybody's gonna be making some weird faces throughout <laughs> I don't know. Or like um, I've done Zooms. I've been in court uh, on Zoom and I don't know how to put this. You're the technical person, but the people that are uh, on hold, they're along the top here. They're mm -hmm. all along the top in little screens. And then the people that are speaking like the judge and maybe one or two of the attorneys are down down here where we are. Uh, I don't know how to I don't know how to really do that. <laughs> but they're they're you get the idea. They're in the waiting room. That's what they call it, right? They're, they're yeah. in the waiting room. And then when they speak, now they come down into the screen. So I think that uh, I think some additional production needs to be thought about. Yeah. Uh, okay. We've beaten that to a yeah. dead horse. Your it's turn. like you can tell when I edit videos, I'm as I beat it a little bit more. It's like if I edit videos, if I'm not talking, I usually like crop myself out. Right. You, it's exactly. a little, yeah. It's yeah. a lot of footage to go through, but yeah. Um, yeah. So let's see. Next comment. Da -da 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 -da. I don't understand the judge saying, is there anything I can do to help move this forward? But well, what about the 11 requests for discovery? Does the request just sitting there collecting dust? Why hasn't JJJ 
which I love that JJJ said to Thompson, you have X amount of weeks to get all the requests given to defense or else. And that I thought was, I don't know, the 11 requests for discovery is a little wild to me. I'd be frustrated if I were. The I defense. think we talked about that before. That was uh, slide number one. That was mm -hmm. point. That was uh, insight. Number one. Uh, we, I can't answer that. Uh, and I, we went over the criminal rule 16 in Idaho that says this is stuff that must be turned over if the defense asks for it. And now this is, again, over and above the Brady material, uh, the exculpatory uh, information that has to be turned over constitutionally. We went over the rule that says, you know, if the defense asks for this stuff and it's material, it, it they must turn it over. So I don't have an answer for that. I just, I really. I don't have um, the comment here. But there was a comment on one of our previous videos talking about that. And they were saying, well, you know, if they did have the information, like, why wouldn't they want to give it to the defense? So that, like, why would they want to give up all their secrets or something like that? And it, I don't, it doesn't really work like that. I feel no. like you can't really argue against something that you don't know what you're arguing about at all. Yeah, this isn't like kids playing hide and seek. This is this is dealing with a man's life and the lives of the families of the victim. And having a fair trial is very important. And we've said it before, um, towards the end of our uh, presentation here today, we always have to remember that this case, we always focus on what's going on in the court, the gesticulations between the attorneys. But this case is about, you know, Kayla, Kaylee, Maddie, Ethan, and Zana. This case is about them and it's about their families. And, you know, we have to always remember that. And I always say that. I, what are they thinking as they they watch all of that? What uh, what can they possibly be thinking uh, when they watch people say, well, I have 21 terabytes and I, I can't do it. It's almost like, well, the dog's going to eat my homework, so I can't. It's a, no, mm -hmm. no, this is serious business. Um, we put a light on it sometimes, but I mean, let's go, let's, let's move it. Let's, let's, you know, move, move the question. So anyhow, any closing thoughts, Lainey? I just want to say thank you to everybody that comments on our videos. I started up the video talking about the commenters. I end almost every video thanking the commenters. Uh, it definitely is fun reading through all the comments. We'll get like over a hundred comments on the video and it's like so exciting to read through. I'm like scrolling and then it's like, oh, there's no more. <laughs> so we really do appreciate that. And everybody who's excited about our videos. Thank you so much. I read them too. I read the comments. We appreciate them. Uh, as I have said before and quoted one of the other YouTubers who I like to watch. Uh, her name is uh, Christina. I think I said before her name is Christine. Her name is Christina. She's very smart and she goes into these topics in a more, how do I put it, a more personal kind of a way. She sits back and she, you know, talks as though she were just talking uh, to a friend, having a cup of coffee. I, I wish we could approach that kind of congeniality, but that's just not me. Anyhow, I won't, I won't speak for you, but as she always says in the beginning of all of her um, podcasts, be nice, be respectful. We're big boys and girls, but, you know, we can all respectfully disagree. So please comment and like and let us know how you feel, but be nice. You have been watching About the Law, a production of the law offices of Andrew D. Myers in Methuen in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts and in Derry, just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. Remember to click the like and subscribe buttons down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to share it with your friends and others. If you'd like to talk to me about an injury case, a car accident, a slip and fall, a serious bodily injury case, or some other case, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you. You can contact us through my website at attorney myers Dot com. We have a contact us block, or you can call on one of the telephone numbers we've given there, or you can email me at andrew at attorney-myers.com. The foregoing is offered for informational purposes only. It is not intended as and does not constitute legal advice. Laws vary widely from state to state. You should rely only on the advice given to you during a personal consultation by a local attorney thoroughly familiar with state laws and the area of practice in which your concern lies. 
This podcast must be and hereby is labeled advertisement in some jurisdictions. And that's that. It's all in the tunnels. It's all about the tunnels. No tunnels, no phone calls. (laughs) It's all about the tunnels.